Good morning. I'm uh, Derek Hawkins. I'm a cybersecurity reporter at the Washington Post, and I'm the author of the Cybersecurity 202 newsletter. I'm pleased to introduce my guest, Christopher Krebs. He's the Undersecretary of the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He's a Trump appointee. He was officially confirmed in that role in June after having previously served as Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection. Before joining DHS, he was Director for Cybersecurity Policy on Microsoft's U.S. Government Affairs team, where he led the company's work on cybersecurity and technology issues. His agency has the immense responsibility of protecting the nation's critical infrastructure uh, from cyber threats, whether that's power plants, healthcare, wastewater treatment plants, and of course, he's leading uh, some very important work uh, to help make our elections safe. Uh, so thank you for being here, Undersecretary. Uh, I'm wondering, um, after Trump's meeting in Helsinki with Putin this week, uh, the president said he's protecting elections and standing up to Russia's malign influence. Do you agree with that? I absolutely do. Look, he's pretty clear on Tuesday, uh, the intelligence community assessment. Uh, puts the, the blame for 2016 election meddling squarely on Russia, and uh, the president uh, is fully behind that. And I have, in my organization, the responsibility for supporting state and local election officials and protecting their systems. I'm fully empowered, have all the resources I need to do that, uh, and we are working very closely with state and local officials. Uh, at this point, through the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, we're working with all 50 states. Uh, we're providing a range of uh, technical services from vulnerability assessments to remote scanning capabilities to a number of states. Uh, we provide information, intelligence, but we also provide training uh, through a number of the training platforms that DHS has, but also we're doing exercises and uh, incident response planning. So, And how much of that direction is coming from the White House? That was Trump telling you to do this? Well, I, I think we need to be clear that the that I don't talk to President Trump. I'm an undersecretary, sure. right? Uh, the, but Secretary Nielsen uh, engages uh, the, the president and the National Security Advisor and her peers across the interagency on a regular basis on, on election security issues, yeah. But is there an ar overarching strategy from the White House uh, on, that coordinates some of the different agencies' responsibilities, uh, how we respond to election security threats? So we have clear direction, right? Uh, but the, at the operational technical agency level, I work very closely with the FBI, with the intelligence community, uh, with the State Department on a range of election security and countering foreign uh, information operations activities. Uh, could we do a better job of coordination? Absolutely. But we got to, in, in the last panel. What do you need to do better? Well, so the last panel put it out uh, uh, very, very well that this is. This is, in, in, in a sense, a, a kind of a, a new front in uh, the online uh, battle space. Information operations is frankly not something that we've had to deal with uh, over the, the last eight years. And the Department of Homeland Security, when you think about when we were established in 2003 after, two th uh, after the 9-11 attacks, we were a counterterrorism uh, and anti-terrorism organization. Look at the way the risk landscape has evolved since 2001 to today. We have very clear nation state adversaries that we're going toe to toe with hand to hand combat on a day, to, day in day out basis. And the organizations from a legal structure perspective, uh, th there's a, it's a, more of a lagging indicator. I mean, look, we, we, Derek, we've talked about this and you've written about it. I have a piece of legislation up on the Hill working with Chairman McCall and, and Chairman Johnson just to change my name as an organization sure. from NPPD, which I'll give five bucks to anybody in the audience that knows what that means, to the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agents. That, that legislation has been languishing for quite a while. Who's against it? I, you know, I, I don't know anybody that's against it. I just think... What's the hang-up then? That I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, maybe what we need to do a better job of from the department, but also industry, is, is, uh, is communicate why this is so important, why we need to do this. It's going to help me recruit. It's going to help me cement my position across the federal family, but also it's going to make things easier for me when I go out into the field and provide technical assistance and incident response services to the critical infrastructure community across the private sector and across the state and local market uh, of, of who it is, who I am, and what I do. And that's, that's honestly, that's part of the reason that we, uh, that we had some initial challenges, one of the reasons that we had some initial challenges engaging the election community last time around, because it was some random 
you know, NPPD, it sounds like a Soviet era uh, intelligence agency. You know, it doesn't tell, tell anybody what we do. Mm -hmm. What other challenges are you facing when you go out and talk to the states about election security, when you advise them on how to improve their election systems? What do you need to do better? So this about? is a really interesting area because what I've seen over the last year, and I've been involved in the Department of Homeland Security's critical infrastructure protection activities since their inception back in the 2000s. I have never seen a level of engagement so rapidly and so deeply across any infrastructure sector like I have with elections. So in the last less than a year, we've established a number of coordinating mechanisms, an ISAC, which is an information sharing and an analysis center, which, and I'll try to keep this at an acronym free zone, <laughs> uh, a, an information sharing mechanism that has close to 1,000 members in five months. That's unheard of across the critical infrastructure community. Now, when we talk about challenges, there are still concerns about federal government intervention with elections. They are, by, by the Constitution and by statute, administered in the responsibility of state and local governments. That is still the challenge that we're facing. Now, it is a matter of trust. So we have got to build strong partnerships, and we have to establish trust with those, with those folks. Trust takes time. It takes constant engagement. It takes personal outreach. I've been over the last six months on a, frankly, kind of a road show across the country uh, for primary day. I've showed up, talked to Secretary of State, talked to election directors, asked them, what do you need? How am I doing? How can I help you better? What are you hearing from Secretaries of State about what they need? They, what do they need most? So what, I think what they need, well, money. That's, yeah. Everybody needs money. I need money. They need money. Uh, these systems are, are, are expensive to replace, and state budgets are generally not constructed for widespread IT capital investments mm -hmm. on a SNAP basis. Now, these aren't SNAP necessarily, but if you're telling me that you need to replace $80 million worth of equipment right now, that's a hard sell at the state level. Congress has sent some money to the states to do just this, $380 million back in March. Uh, last I checked, all the states have requested that money. Yep. Most states are spending against that right now. Yep. But you talk to secretaries of state, and they almost universally say, this is just a start. This isn't enough. Yeah. We need money on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, Congress just signaled this week that it's not ready to send more money to the states. Just yesterday, it voted down uh, you know, what would have been another $380 million. Yeah to do that, to replace these, these voting machines, to patch these vulnerabilities, to hire IT staff. How is that affecting their preparedness, not just in 2018, but 2019, 2020? So there are a couple things in there in that question. So first is the 380 million that went out to the states uh, in the 2000, or the FY18 omnibus. 380 million that was distributed based on uh, 2010 registered vote, consensus, or census-based registered voters. So in some cases, you've got states that get 13 million. In other states, it, you may get 3 million. Uh, that's a lot, to be clear, but it's not enough if you're talking about a state that has to replace all of their uh, DREs, which is New the New Jersey, yeah. Georgia, and, and, you know, in some in some cases, we're talking about eighty million dollars. DREs, by the way, are the uh, electronic voting, touchscreen voting yeah. machines that are hack prone, basically, yep. right? Well, they have certain vulnerabilities. Now, those can be their compensating controls, but yeah, you want to you. We're kind of digressing here, but mm. you want <laughs> you want a paper based. Tr uh, a voter verifiable pa paper uh, trail for any voting system, and you want to do post-election audits. Those are the things we recommend. Uh, but those, both of those, if you don't have them, cost money. Mm -hmm. So where's it coming from? So here's my sense of what's going on right now. States need money. Yes, they need money to replace these systems. They need money to institute post-election audits. Uh, where's that money going to come from? Uh, it, it is the responsibility of the states to administer elections. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of the Department of Homeland Security and the federal government uh, to provide for the national security and national defense of this country. There is a discussion that needs to happen between those two things. What, what I think needs, we need to do in, in a very near future is rather than just say, we need money, give us money, it's we need X amount of money to address X threat and buy down X amount of risk. We have to be much more precise, much States clearer. have to be much more precise? I think so. I think if, if a state needs money, they need to say what they need it for and how much they need. And that's going to help inform and drive the conversation on the Hill. Otherwise, just a, a, a general statement of, I need a billion dollars. Well, for what? Mm -hmm. 
So we, uh, we, have, we work closely with states to help them understand what the risk, they, and they know what the risk is. Sure. They, these, these state secretaries of state, election directors, they are natural risk managers. Even before the Russians came knocking, they were dealing on a daily basis or on election day with uh, power outages, tornadoes, hurricanes in the southeast. Uh, civil unrest happens on primary days. So they, they manage risk, they, they work through contingency plans. This is just another significant risk uh, profile for mm -hmm. them. There's another risk I want to talk about, mm -hmm. and this is something I hear uh, from secretaries of state, from election officials. I've also heard it from um, you know, your colleagues at DHS, and this is the idea that voter confidence is a yeah. risk that's really hard to mitigate. And that this, I've heard this described as the biggest election security challenge that we face. When the president contradicts himself on the Russia threat, how does that affect voter confidence? Well, look, I think the bigger issue here is just as you said, it's voter confidence in general that we have the Russians trying to undermine our democracy. The intelligence community assessment is very clear. Again, the president has supported the ICA and endorses the results or, or the, 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 well, the findings. Well, he's back and forth on that question. Yeah, but look, he is, I, look, I am not, I take the president at his word. When he says on Tuesday that he endorses the ICA, that's what I work with. But there's the headlines is that, here. Is that what you tell the people that you're advising out in the states when the, when the president says these things? I mean, what do, you, what, what do you tell them? What do I tell the, here's what I tell the states. We know we have a risk. We know there's a threat. Let's work together to close out that risk. The headlines here, the operational space here. I live in the operational space. Mm -hmm. That's where I have to get my job done. Not in the headlines, in the operational space. So when I go out and I meet with secretaries of state, again, I ask, what do you need? What are you concerned about? Yeah, there are a lot of situations where folks are, there's public confidence. And that is in part driven by the fact that we continue to have in the headline space, the Russians are hacking the election. We've also really got to be clear on what the Russians had access to from a technical cybersecurity perspective in the 16 elections. There's the administration of elections, which is voter registration uh, and all the kind of front end stuff. The, 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 that's not at all connected to the other half of the equation, which is what do you mean vote, by front end stuff? Just so it's voter clear. registration, it's voter it's registration development, systems, uh, ballots. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's not the tabulation, counting of votes, and reporting of votes. Sure. Separate, generally speaking, best practice over in the voter tabulation and counting space. Uh, the, uh, they're, they're not connected to the internet or otherwise significant compensating controls around those systems. There's something if I wanted to ask about these state voter registration systems being a yep. target. So special counsel Mueller's most recent indictments uh, kind of spelled out some new details about how carefully crafted these attacks were and these, these probing where we knew, for example, that hackers breached uh, a state voter registration database. We didn't know that they stole until last week, that they stole information on 500,000 voters. Did it scare you to read that? So let me, let me kind of unpack that a little bit. Sure. We knew that they had exfiltrated, stolen voter registration information out of that state uh, voter registration system. We did not necessarily know, I didn't necessarily know, that it was 500,000. We mm -hmm. thought it was in the 100,000 or so. At the time, a year or so ago, when the ICA was, the intelligence community assessment was reported, that 500,000 number is due to additional investigation as a part of the, the Mueller investigation, which is firewalled from the rest of DOJ, the rest of FBI, DHS, and the intelligence community. Sure. So well, I, I found it interesting, sure. Um, is there additional you know, undermining of voter confidence possible there? Yeah, maybe. But let's, you know, going back to well, how, do you, how do you counter that? I mean, if, you know, if education and awareness. Here's, here's the thing. We're out there uh, on a daily basis working with state and lo local folks. And in part, we provide risk and vulnerability assessments. Through those vulnerability assessments, we get in, the, in, the, in their systems. We, we try to look for vulnerabilities throughout. And we're generally finding three common trends across those systems. First is they run outdated. Uh, operating systems. They're not on the most modern systems. The most modern systems are just by their default nature, the, generally the most uh, secure. Second is they have some patch management and vulnerability management challenges. So when the operating system or whatever pushes a patch, it takes a lot longer or in some cases they don't actually 
patch those, those, uh, uh, that software. And the third thing is just some misconfiguration error. So the state that was uh, the, the voter registration database that was uh, accessed uh, by the Russians in 16, uh, there were some misconfiguration errors. So we share that information, not just with the folks that we've done vulnerability assessments for, but more broadly across the country. So again, back to that voter registration and the awareness piece. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, the Russians get in there and just like uh, Chris Painter said about integrity of data but also the availability of data, if they had gotten in there and deleted files, corrupted files, doing something like that, the way the system by law is not just the technical system but the broader election system is constructed is that if you, anyone in this room or watching online, show up to vote, and something's wrong with your registration. Either you're not in the system, or they're sorry, sorry, you, you know, you're you're clearly not a, a woman, and yet this says, you know, you are. Um, you have the right, by law, to request a provisional ballot. So even though you're not in the system, you can request a provisional ballot. Your vote will be counted. Every state's a little bit different in how they administer provisional ballots, but nonetheless, you have the constitutional right and the ability to vote. It takes a little bit of time. It can be disruptive on election day, and it can cause a little bit of concern. But this happens already without Russians getting involved. LA County a couple weeks Maryland ago. Maryland a couple weeks ago. Maryland as well. a couple weeks ago. Same thing. It's it's critically important that state officials communicate with the voting public to let them know their rights. Now, again, worst case scenario, they delete those files. You uh, cast a provisional ballot your vote gets counted. That's a sign of resilience in the system. It can take a hit, experience some, some difficulties, but you still get to the end result. And I make this terrible joke uh, based on uh, a comedian, Mitch Hedberg, who's, who passed away, but it's the equivalent of an escalator. When an escalator breaks, it turns into stairs. You can still get where you're going. It takes a little bit more effort, but the system works, and that's what we're trying to reinforce with elections. You, you recently said that we haven't seen any activities along the lines of what we did in 2016. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by that, and what do you do if you start seeing an uptick in that type of activity? So, so here's the, the broader challenge is, particularly in this town, we have a threat intelligence problem. What I mean by that is that I see intelligence, I see reporting, on stuff every day that, that would look absent context concerning. What we're saying with, we haven't seen a campaign on the scale of 2016 of concerted attacks against election infrastructure, concerted attacks against campaigns. Yes, Microsoft made an announcement yesterday about three Russian, uh, about three campaigns being targeted. That is concerning. And so we're gonna work with them, we're gonna get that information. The FBI has worked with them to share information, to shore up defenses. And that's what we're doing, is I am Has taking, that changed? You, did, did learning that change your no, approach I, or cause you to rethink nope. anything you're doing? Because here's why. I don't need to see evidence. I don't need to see threat intelligence that they're launching another attack on the lines of 2016. Because we know they have the capability and they have demonstrated the intent. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to knock on the door of a secretary of state and say, hey, we got a problem here. We've got a risk in the system, we need to work together. And that's the biggest issue as I see it. For too long, whether it's an, a company, and, and Mike Rogers just mentioned this, uh, Chairman Rogers just mentioned this about the challenges he sees with CISOs uh, that are just getting beat up every day. No company out there, no state out there is gonna be able to overcome this challenge by themselves. We have to work together. We're pushing a collective security model, a collective defense model, where we work together to manage risk, to counter the threat over there, and that's the intelligence community and that's the Department of Defense, and we buy down, we address risk here domestically, and that's where my organization is at. Well, uh, speaking of working together, the Justice Department just announced this new policy yep. that it's going to start uh, alerting the public about foreign influence campaigns. Uh, as part of its efforts to combat these attempts to disrupt yep. U.S. democracy. Where, does, where do you fit into that? Where does your agency fit into that? So there are a number of efforts afoot across the foreign government, or the U.S. government, rather, uh, to operate in the, uh, to counter the influence uh, operation space. Now, this is a little technical, and there's a bit of a taxonomy that we've built out, but foreign, and, and maybe the, the way I prefer to talk about it is foreign interference. Because mm -hmm. look, foreign influence, 
That's why we have a Department of State. That's why other governments have ministries of foreign affairs. Foreign influence is diplomacy. The problem is when foreign influence it's also a law enforcement turns now, into, though. yeah, but when foreign influence crosses the line of sovereignty, national interest, or values, that's when we get into a foreign interference space. So when we does, map- Does DHS have a formal role in this though? We have, yeah, so the department- In, in what the Department of Justice is doing? We, we work alongside the Department of Justice, the FBI and their Foreign Influence Task Force. Secretary Nielsen established a countering foreign uh, interference task force several months back. So what the, the FBI is very focused on, law, law enforcement action against specific actors. What my team is doing is working alongside the FBI working alongside the intelligence community to understand broader trends, to understand broader uh, techniques and tactics that adversaries use. Let's also be clear that foreign interference is bigger than trying to undermine an election. Mm. They've been doing this for years. They try to undermine our confidence that our system works, our government system, our society works, our open access and freedom of speech. They're attempting to undermine that to point out that, that America is failing, and it's not. And so what we are doing, again, is uh, identifying trends, building case studies, sharing across the interagency, sharing with private sector, but also trying to figure out how to get more of that information uh, out into the general public about, hey, here's how you spot uh, an influence operation underway. Here's the information that you're being presented, and here are ways to think critically about the information that, that, that you're looking at. Are you sharing uh, information about specific threats with social media companies, for example? I know last month that you met with Facebook yep. and a no number of other companies in Silicon Valley. Was that last month? That feels like it was a year ago. Maybe it was longer ago. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, are, are you sharing information with them? Are you telling them what they need to brace for? So the government works. They, yeah, the government works with the social media companies absolutely. But it, my it's team MPPD is your team. Yeah, my team has uh, historical relationships with uh, social media, with technology companies, with communi telecommunications providers. Uh, historical relationships based on uh, cybersecurity indicator threat sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, but they say, they, you talk to them and they say, we, we need this information. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and are they getting it? Uh, the government is, is working with those folks, yeah. Providing them, uh, again, what I'm looking for is trends on activities, whether it's in, from intelligence holdings, looking at classified uh, uh, activities and bringing them down into an unclassified space to help them refine algorithms, to help them figure out what it is that, that they're doing uh, to, to, uh, to counter threats on their platforms. Um, you know, one, the previous panel talked about this, the need for a sort of uh, whole of government response yeah. that seems to fit into that. How important is that? Um, and, uh, and do you think the Trump administration is really moving in that direction? Because right now I see a lot of agencies doing a lot of things on their own, you know, NSA and Cyber Command teaming up. I see, you know, what you're doing with DHS. I see what the Justice Department announced uh, just last night. Is that a whole of government response? response? Uh, if so, you know, where are the instructions on that coming from? So it is. There, there is a whole of government effort afoot. There's not is there someone heading that up in the White House? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it comes from the National Security Advisor that, that cybersecurity is a top priority for this administration. There was an executive order released last year, 13800, um, that reinforces and reemphasizes our approach to cybersecurity. What we is are doing- Is there a doing, whole of government response specifically, though, to election security? The, yeah. There, yeah. I, again, I work every day, my team at the operational level works every day with the FBI, with the intelligence community, uh, with state and local officials. There is a whole of government effort. Uh, we are, uh, to the broader point of coordination, I have, you know, this is my second time in government, back in the, the Bush years, I was uh, at DHS as well. I've never seen the level of cooperation and uh, coordination across the, the federal family. And I, I gotta, you know, frankly, I have to attribute it to the nation state space, in part, in part attribute to the nation state space, because we have just a clear adversary. It is, it's remarkable how acute uh, the risk space is and how everybody has clarity of mission and purpose of, of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, it, frankly, it helps me from a recruiting basis that I can get out there and I can communicate. It's like, hey, look, we're sitting out here hunting for Russians and Chinese on US government networks, on private sector networks, uh, on critical infrastructure networks every day. I mean, what, what more could you want in the job? Are there other threats that we're maybe uh, disregarding because we're so focused on Russia right now? 
I don't think their threats we're disregarding. I think that in the headline space, mm -hmm. there are threats that are not being, uh, they're not given their, their due. I'm telling you right now, China is the long-term strategic threat for this country. And it's not just from a direct technical cybersecurity perspective, but look at the way they do uh, strategic investment. Uh, CFIUS rules have to change because they are pivoting around our approaches. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, Chairman Rogers mentioned the big four between Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. I mean, the, these are the nation state adversaries that we see active every day in the space. Our challenge is understanding what they are trying to do, what their capabilities are, and what their intent is. That's the intelligence community space. My job is saying, so what? What does this piece of intelligence mean? What is the context? What are the potential consequences? And then asking a second question of what are we going to do about it? So to your, to your coordination, it's not just about government working together. It's about industry and government working together. We have to have integrated cross-sector government industry collaboration um, uh, in the cybersecurity space, in the critical infrastructure protection space. And that's, that's where we're, we're going. We're in the process of launching a national risk management initiative that is going to focus on those activities, working with the Department of Energy, working with the Department of Treasury, working with the sector-specific agencies that have exquisite and unique understanding of sector-specific uh, technical aspects and bringing them in to a, a, a coordination capability that uh, uh, supports cybersecurity expertise and industrial control systems expertise. Great. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I want to thank you, Undersecretary Thanks, Krebs, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to let uh, you know uh, that you can see highlights from today's program and learn more about upcoming events by visiting WashingtonPostLive.com. Thanks to everyone in the room and thank everyone you. online who joined us.